Who's enjoyed our series on a life after God's own heart? Uh, it's, it's, I've, I've found it great just to be able to do it, to be honest. I just love taking chunks of scripture and looking at lives of people living on the absolute fiery edge of life and just seeing what difference uh, a God framework, not only a God framework, but a God heart does in the, in the lives of each of us. Because we've all seen that we believe certain things, we have a moral grid of things that are right and wrong, but we don't always live by that. Um, but we do live by what matters most. And to determine what that is, sometimes we just need to crystallise that down, boil away life. And there's nothing better than a good season like David had of 14 years of tribulation to boil away the rubbish and you're just left with the hardcore, who am I? Who is God? What does this thing mean? And so um, I've just loved delving back again into this and, and we'll just keep going with this sort of thing for as long as I sense the Lord saying. Um, just to restore... The Western church is messed up. I don't know whether you've noticed this, but we've, 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 we've drifted of course, just a bit, and, and it's just good to come back. We've been enamoured with things like uh, attractional church, where it's, you know, you've got to be cool if you want, to, if you want people to come, you've got to have smoke and mirrors and, and all the stuff, and uh, those days have, have drifted, they've, they've gone, and I, I thank God for that, I thank God for that, because I'm, I'm the most uncool guy I know, so it was just never going to work here. But, but you get down to the heart, I'll talk about that. You talk, you talk about courage and fire and, and let's do something worth fighting for. I'm in for that fight, you know. So, so this is just, it's good for us to boil ourselves back down again and get to the hardcore centre of what your life is and mine in God. And so we've been looking at different sorts of values. And um, we talked in uh, one week about letting God be God. Just let God do what only God can do. We're not going to do it for him. We're not going to try and make things happen in our own way. And then uh, last week was God's way or no way. And this week, just to introduce the topic, because it's very important that it's just not a session where I'm just giving information. Uh, you probably get better information online, to be honest. But it's great to be able to process with a bit of interactive and to see uh, how this lands on Monday. But who mows the lawn? Who's the lawn mower in the family? Show of hands. Right out, you got. And the rest, the rest are praying, uh, supporting, whatever it is. But when you mow the lawn, there's, this, there's a magic, there is a moment when you mow the lawn. We all know what this moment is. You go out to the council strip and the neighbours hasn't cut their lawn yet. And then you're going to mow the lawn and you have a, there's a moral choice now. It's life and death. <laughs> do I mow their bit or do I just let it go because it's a victimless crime and it's theirs to look after anyway? But it's going to look a bit weird because you're, you've got a short back and sides and they've got furry bits hanging over. So what's, what's the heart of man do at that point? Does, does it go, I have, from the overflow of my soul, I'm just going to mow my neighbour's lawn. I'm sweaty, I'm, I'm feeling foul, but I'm doing that because God loves me and I love my neighbour. Or do you just go, there's just no way no, I'm going to do that. And we just, you know, what's, maybe some days are better than others, to be honest. I, true confession is some days are better. Some days I do. There's an occasional day where I go, I'm just too tired. You know, I should have done that bit first. But, I, but, but without fail, um, the conviction of my heart in that moment is where are you at? How low is your tank if you even need to ask that question? What's wrong with you, Hegarty? Well, like, honestly, man, mow that guy's yard, both sides, and whip a snip, and then blow it up afterwards. Blow it back after it. Not blow it up. <laughs> that comes to mind, Kerry. He never mows his lawn. All right. Anyway. Or... Perhaps you see a beggar on the street, you might, it just takes you by surprise, you're walking along, suddenly someone's uh, rattling the can, and uh, what's your heart react? Not your thought through, not what you know you should. In, when it happens to you, what, what happens in your heart? You go, mm, oh, and you find a way to look away, cross the street, avoid. Uh, does your mind go that way, or does it go, oh, what, can I, what have I got? Credit card, there you go, it's all yours. I wonder what your heart response is at that moment. And we have good days and bad days. And so I'm not talking about being a, a differentiating spenders from savers or anything like that. I'm talking about a state of the soul that's either um, a prosperous soul or a, or a poverty soul. And I'm not going to do a, a message on prosperity doctrine. Don't worry, that belongs back in the 80s. But, but being prosperous is actually a biblical concept. And prosperous is a sense that there is no limit to what God's supply is. So there is no limit to how much generosity I can show because I'm coming from an unlimited supply, whereas a poverty spirit is aware of what we don't have and tries to protect what it has, if, it, if I could put it in that sort of simplistic terms. But what comes from the heart when the heart's broken, when the heart is dry, 
when you have done the mowing strip at the wrong end of the day or the wrong end of the mowing job, you know, you get to the end instead of the beginning. What, what, what's happening in the heart at that point in your life? Um, it might be that time where you're walking along, you've got your, your inbox is too full, you've got too many appointments coming up and someone just shouts, hey, have you got a minute? And you, and you know that person's going to take 15 or 20 and you know you haven't got it. How does it react? How do you over... It's like, mm, yes, yes, I've got time for you. You know, but you know what I'm talking about. It's like, oh, is, there, is this soul prosperous? Is it aware of what I don't have or is it aware of what I have in unlimited supply? Because a candle... If we have a fire in our heart, a candle, you give that fire away and, the, and it does, your fire doesn't go out. If the, if the supply is endless, we can just give it away. So we're going to focus in on how this worked out for the life of David in 1 Samuel 30. And it is one of my favourite passages. Of, it's a great leadership um, uh, principle, what comes out here. But the situation now is that David is 30 years of age. He doesn't know that he's only a day or two away from becoming king. And the dogs of doom bark loudest at the door of destiny. I don't know whether you've figured that one out. When you're at the threshold of God doing something great, that's when the opposition and the shouts and the intimidation comes the most. So David's now 14 years into this scene. He's been exiled for 16 years. His whole adult life has been a bust. He's been given a promise of kingship and he thought we're heading north and life just took him south and his whole adult life has been working through the disappointment of that. How do I be who God's called me to be? Uh, what does this look like in real life? So it's very possible he was always having to manage uh, dejection, rejection, absolutely. And he's at a moment now where he's been rejected by his king, he's been rejected by his army, been rejected by his country, He's been living in the, the country of the Philistines whose champion he had killed. So he wasn't great on the popularity list there anyway and he's living with these guys now. They go to war with Israel and he goes, well, these, my guys hate me. I might as well join with you so at least you'll trust me. They go, there's no way no we're trusting you. You get out of here, you go home and go sit in the cave somewhere. So now even his enemies have rejected him. And then he gets back to his little village at a place called Ziklag uh, it's just a little gathering of, of tents or whatever there in a little valley. And he gets back and as he comes over the brow of the hill, he sees all that he had left, which wasn't a lot, has been destroyed. It's been burnt to the ground and his family has been taken. Now you want to trigger a guy as brutal as David, you take away his family. So now he's not just dejected, now he's cranky <laughs> and he's sad. So we pick up the story there in verse 4 of chapter 30. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. That's grief. I don't know whether you've been through that trauma where you, you, you have mourned life so much you don't even know how to mourn anymore, where it's just been so dark for so long you don't know anything else and you think this is just how my story is going to end. So there is no light at the end of the tunnel. There is just not even a tunnel anymore. It's just dark. And many of us have known that dark night of the soul so he was already having a bad time and it just somehow got worse. And now he's, these are strong men who now have no more strength left to weep. David's two wives have been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. It just got worse. It just found a way to get worse. Now these bunch of ragtag guys, oh sorry, this is a scripture, I'm just making this up. Uh, <laughs> this, isn't the, this isn't the living Bible or something I'm quoting from here. Um, it just got, how could it get worse? But it just goes south. Each one was bitter in his spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Somehow, it wasn't attitude. It, just, it wasn't that he summoned up a great moment of his own strength. He had nothing left. There was no strength left. The core had been boiled down, reduced down. That was just his inner core. And that inner core could do nothing but find strength in God. That's all he had. And it was all he would do anyway. Regardless of what else was happening in his life, that's always the way David was going to react. JFK once said uh, that success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. Nobody wants to own the failure. You know? So what does everyone do when there's a failure? Blame the guy at the top of the tree. Because it must be his fault, you know. David's probably going, can I just check out and leave this to someone else? Can I literally just have a moment and just, you know, not have this sitting on my shoulders? And so it just went from 
unconditionally bad to even worse on him. And so David actually turned to God. He found strength from God. He didn't find the strength to go to God. He found strength from God. And it's a bit... Sometimes we expect people just to get their act together, just to pick themselves up and get there. And sometimes you just can't because you, you can't expect a car to go fuel itself up with petrol if it can't get to the fuel tank, can't get to the fuel station. You're done. You need grace. You need more grace. You need God to give you what you can't give yourself. And this was the overflow of David's life. He'd lived his whole life this way. So it was always going to be the way he responded. But your ability to be God's person in, in, in the... In the to be the person he's called you to be, to live the life he's called you to live. Your ability to do that over the long term is only going to be as strong as your ability to find your strength from God. Now, you can perform, you can, you can get through life, you can do a career, you can do all this stuff, but I'm talking about the life that God's called you to live, the life that confronts the idols of, of life, the, the life that stands up for morality, that sticks up for people, that, that protects what must be protected, does what's, what... Christianity requires us to do and to be. That life, you can't live that life without it beyond the limits of your ability to get your strength from God. And if that's not something that you've had to work through yet, uh, don't worry, that day's probably coming. But Christians in crisis, there's no imposter syndrome there. There's no faking it. The world is seeing who we really are, the real you. And it's not our strength that makes a difference. It's only God's strength. But David didn't measure... This is, this is the lesson from David here. David didn't measure the future path of what God could do based on what God has done purely before, in measure. In principle, yes, but in measure, no. What I'm saying there is he didn't, he didn't say, I'm in crisis now and this is only going to get worse and say, yeah, but I look back in my past and, and God was enough to kill a bear, that's fine, but I remember the trauma of that situation. I remember how bad that was. If that's all the strength he's got, that's not going to get me to where I need to go, so, you, so we back away. He didn't think that way. David's logic was based in, in a, a greater principle that said if he can provide that, he can provide anything. If God gave me $2, there's $20,000 for his purposes for coming. If I can kill a bear, I can kill Goliath. If I escape Saul's army of young men, I can, I can conquer any army. If I've lived through today, I can live through any day. So his logic was based in a prosperity of soul that said there is no limit to what God can give me because I've seen him always give me what I've required to this time. So he'll always be enough. Whatever comes at me, if I'm living from his grace, not relying on myself, I will actually always have enough. So he was free. At that moment, in finding strength from God, he was free to seek God and not to scramble and try and find his own solution to this. So let's move on with the story and see what he does. So David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. The ephod uh, was a, um, a thing that they put over their shoulders and it had uh, two stones, the umum and thumum, erum, urum or thumb, I think they're called, black and white stones, and they were used as a, as a guidance protocol. And they would, they would present God with a question and he would say, yes, no, do this, do that, black and white sort of stuff. So that was the ephod. Uh, Abiathar brought it to him and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. That's the word of knowledge we all want to hear, eh? You, you cannot fail. David and the 600 men with him came to the Besor Valley where some stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley. But David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. An interesting moment just there that they don't, it, the scripture doesn't drill down in, but you can imagine the management of disappointment there. It's like, guys, there's a lot of them and there's only a few of us and, and we're going to lose a third of our army now because you can't get up the other side of this valley. What hope have we got? You know? So they're already tired. They're, they're, they're shot. And you can imagine there would have been frustration getting managed there, but the, the people who went, well, you know, they, they're trying to manage how are we going to do this. But David would have gone on his own, I'm convinced of it. He would have gone if it was just him. Him plus God equals a majority. He was just going to be out there anyway. So anyway, off they went and the, and the 400 that were left went. And if you read the passage later on, you'll find that they, um, long story short, they discovered the Amalekites. They, um, they got there at sort of dusk, end of the day, and they fought them then for 24 hours straight without a break. So you picture that. They've, they've come back from the Philistine army, found their camp, gone straight to pursue these guys. That's taken them a long time. They haven't stopped. Then they fought without sleep for 24 hours. Man, and that passage ends by saying only 400 of the young men, the Amalekites, survived. Only 400. David's men were only 400. 
and they said only 400 survived of theirs. In other words, many more didn't survive. It was carnage. It would have been just absolute carnage. Would make a great movie if you're into that sort of scene, I guess. It would have been fine. But only 400 got away. So you can imagine the state of them after that. See, David was a brutal man. And I want to raise that because if such a brutal man could do, could do that, he's just killed probably single-handedly himself. He's probably killed a couple of hundred people in the last 24 hours. Your soul doesn't do well from that. But the thing he does next is, is shocking. What comes out of that after that is just as telling, uh, more telling. Let's pick it up in verse 21. They're on, they're on their way home. They've gotten all their possessions and they've, and they've come back. David and his men approached. They appro- they're approaching the people who'd stayed behind. David asked how they were. How does this guy who's just slain all those people, his first response to those who didn't have the strength to come with him, how are you guys doing? You doing okay? Are you okay? And it's like, who is this guy? Like, are you the same human being? There's something in this that, that cared for his tribe beyond what we can understand. Our generation is a free agent mentality. You, you understand? That loyalty is not a big deal with, with this, this generation. It makes things difficult in many ways uh, to run churches or long-term employment for companies and so on. People, two, two years and you're looking for a different line on the resume, hey? Huh? But this, guy, this mentality was my people are everything. He wasn't fighting for the money. He was fighting for his tribe. He was fighting for people. The prize wasn't the loot. The prize was the people. His people, these people. This is what I'm fighting for. This thing really mattered. So that was his first question. How are you doing? But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they didn't go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. I'm sure in the Hebrew there were some swear words and some profanity in there. But uh, they were making a point. They, they get nothing. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. And here's the, here's the drill. David replied, no, you mustn't do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? Well, I thought a number were going to listen to what he had to say. But more were going to listen to what David had to say. The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. He wasn't taking a poll here. He wasn't considering the factions. He was just saying, no. Why? Because people matter. More than all of this. And more than your crummy attitude, guys. David made this a statute and ordinance for Israel from that day to this. He wasn't king yet, but he was the leader. He wasn't in charge of much of anything, but he was the biggest influence in the country. And he made a reflexive decision at the, at the bottom of his life. He's in an emotional trough. He made one decision from his heart that changed the whole country. He didn't realise that in a, in a week or two's time, he was going to be able to make that a, a, a statue throughout the whole nation. He was prepared to stand alone if he had to, and he would have, but they all backed away. So I just want to pause here a moment and just look at this, because this, this applies to life. There's a common path that we take Maybe I see it more than most, but I know most of us have seen this a little at least. You'll see a journey if you've lived more than a few years where you'll find people go through hardship. It might be early in life. It might be through their teens, their 20s, their 30s. They they experience a real hardship, injustice, trauma, uh, breakdown, whatever it would be, but they keep going. They keep turning up. They don't don't park themselves in a corner and suck their thumb and go, life's over for me. They say, no, I'm turning up. I'm fighting. I'm going to work at this thing. I didn't get any opportunities as a kid, but I'll work hard. I'll go and get qualified. I'll do the stuff, whatever it takes. And they push through and life pushes back. And in that pushing and pulling back, there's this resilience and this growth and this strength and they become a bigger human being and they eventually, maybe not break through, they just get bigger than this whole thing and life ends up in the end caving into them. So they've started with a struggle They've struggled and come through and then they've come out the other side prosperous in the sense of their career, possessions. It's in the end, life has, has backed away and made a way for them. So they have hardship, breakthrough, but then this other dynamic too often happens, which I'm calling hoarding, where they, they want to, then we begin to gather to ourselves that which we've earned because we worked harder than anyone else. So I've earned this. This is mine and I'm not giving it away too easy. 
because I'm the one who's earned it. Why would I give it away? And I'm scared because I know what that felt like back then and I've had to work really hard to get this, so I'm not giving it away. And, I, and, and something shifts. Someone who was so generous when they were young, the hardship and the trauma has resulted in this poverty spirit, even though they're not in poverty anymore. It's still in there. And it's, this isn't the domain of the, the, our grandmas and grandpas who lived through the Great Depression, who had to use the tea bag 15 times. And they, and they went through their whole life doing that. This is Gen Ys, Gen Xs, baby boomers. We still do this because we don't want to go through that struggle again because that really hurt. <laughs> we don't want to go through all that again. And so we get this sort of poverty mentality about it. And I've seen it in young folk who they started out in their 20s, early 30s with not much and, and not much of a worry and they were prepared to give away all they had and, and suddenly they, they marry and... and, and they do well and suddenly there's multiple homes and there's a stock portfolio and there's all this sort of stuff arises. But for some people it's like, yeah, but now I haven't got time for God. Now I haven't got time. This is about us now. And, and, and this fence comes up around our life and we lose the very thing that that, th that experience should have broken and we become a little bit of a hoarder because the, the echo of the past, the, the, that sense of lack that we remember, it doesn't go away. There's still trauma attached to that. And the echo of that begins to define what the future needs to look like because I'm not going to let that happen again. So this same mindset was fueling the lesser angels in David's guise. They're coming from that place. They're going, hang on, we want... No, no. I worked hard. Why can't they? Anyone ever said that? I've made it. Why? Because I worked really hard, so it's up to them to do the same thing. Well, not everyone gets that story. Some people work really hard and still get nowhere. Some people spend their whole life slaving, working really hard, loving their family, sacrificing, and they get to the end of their life, and that's been their story. So it worked out for us, but it may not work out for them. So we can't be so bland about that. I know that's a reflex in our hearts sometimes, but this is what David's guys did. And you see David just react out of this place that was just so different. A different core value comes up because his logic's not centred in limited supply. His, his heart's not founded in what in lack. He's not looking at a pie and saying, There's only a, this pie's only this big. If you get a big slice, I'll get less. Your gain is my loss. He's not thinking like that because for him, the, the booty wasn't the prize. The prize was the people. So whatever we have, we share. We share alike. And so this is what I mean by a prosperous mindset. A prosperous mindset says, it, it, it's, I give generously because I don't need to think about running out because God has no limit. His supply is endless. And I'm not just talking about money now, I'm talking about heart, time, all those sorts of things. Whereas a poverty mindset says the pie is only a certain size and, and, I, and there's only so much I can give away and I'm, I'm feeling like if I give you too much I'm going to miss out. So we begin to compete with one another, we compare with one another. How am I doing? How are you doing? We strive for more and so on. And you can be a wealthy person and still have a poverty mindset. It, yeah, absolutely. So a prosperous mindset enabled David to have a very different view of people. Those who couldn't make it weren't seen as worthless. Not worthless, well, worth, worth less than those who'd gained. The people were the prize, his people. And when God's at work, when God's really at work in us, guys, this is a, for me, and I, I've been asked through the years, what, as we experience renewal and people being full of the Spirit and breakthrough, and what's the key marker? What's the key marker of the, the Spirit of God bringing revival? Is it salvation? Is it miracles? Is it prophecy? Is it healing? What is it? I see the most common marker of God's presence in a group of people is this. It's freedom freedom. When you're truly free, you're free to give because it's got no hold on you anymore. And you look at Acts chapter 2 where it's the iconic moment where the church got it right, Acts 2.43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. It's been a while since I've heard that happening. So what are we doing? What, what, is that, what is our Christian experience? Is it fueled? What's fueling that in our hearts? I'm as challenged as, as I, I was sort of hoping that, that we all are. I'm not pointing a finger. This is culture. But it's culture without the Spirit of God. We're just doing it. We're doing this in our own strength. We're calling this church. 
You know why this isn't church? Church happens after this. This is a building with underground car parking, air conditioning and great lights and a screen. That's, this, is a, this is a moment of celebration. What happens, church is when we engage with each other and we fight for the tribe. I don't, don't just turn up on a convenient Sunday or at a service that suits me. It's like, no, I'm fighting for this tribe. I don't care what time it is. You can do it 10 times a week, I'll still be there. It's, that, that's what David would do. All I want is to be in God's presence, he would say. All I, just one thing I desire, you know, it's like, hang on. We've, we've got it so easy, it's made us easily pleased or easily discouraged, put it that way. And so it's, it's, it's vexing me. It's vexing leaders all over the world right now. And uh, I don't know how much we can do about it, uh, but I know that the thing we call attractional church is, is, is a dead horse that hasn't hit the ground yet. So attractional church is that sort of church where we make it so cool people want to come because it's cool. Big screen, skinny jeans and, and smoke machines, that sort of, you know, it's like, we're the hipsters, baby. That's, that's now gone. The, the, the momentum of that may still be working in odd places, but people want much more than that now. They want authenticity. They want a real experience of God. They want substantive teaching. They want this thing to matter and to matter in our lives, don't we? This, we needed to make it real. We don't know how that needs to look, but, but I know enough of us here to know that's what we're pursuing. We want to keep this real, Hegarty. Come on, make it real. Give us some substance, and I'm with you on that. But we don't know how that needs to be wrapped anymore. All the gauges are changing on that. So we need to fight for the tribe. At the end of the day, the one thing we know is not going to change is that the Christian, the Christian spirit needs to have this fight in their bones. That I don't plug church in on the spare Sunday. I am the church wherever I go. And I look for every opportunity to fight for this tribe. And I guess we don't have those muscles anymore like we need to, and certainly not as much as we need to, because we haven't had to fight. for. It's just been so easy for us. But the days, are, the days are changing. The gravity on all this is moving and, and it's going to be a little bit harder as years go by. It's going to be harder to do my job. There, there may come a time where saying what I say today or what I need to say at times is going to so go against culture that I might get put in jail for it. I have, have friends in different countries who have been. Do we back away from that moment? You know, what, what hill are we prepared to die on? Whatever other hill we die on, this is the one that we should be dying, is fighting for our tribe. And I wonder, I wonder if you have a tribe, do you understand the tribeness of this place, what it can be? People who'll fight for you, people who've got your back, whose back you've got as well. And uh, this is a journey, it's a journey for us, but it's just one we need to, I think, prayerfully come into because discipleship is demonstrated, overflow, by our commitment to other people. Not as an obligation, but as an overflow. It's a key sign of spiritual maturity is how connected I am to the people in my tribe. Pretty tough for a um, free agent generation. But let's move on. There's another lesson here which is fascinating. David's, because it's a leadership lesson, David's response was a... See, statistically speaking, uh, and it's a bit broad, broad brush, but often those who complain the most, those who demand most loudly, those who shout from the rooftops, the, the far right and left on social media that stream at the, at the exhausted middle of us, you know, those ones are normally the ones who contribute to the solution the least. It's a fascinating stat. Um, we see it in church world, we see it in business life. You know, those who are the, the biggest voices negative are normally the ones who contribute to the tribe the least. Um, but there are rare occasions like this one where those who actually sacrifice the most, the hardcore ones, are actually making a point. And to go against that tide is a leadership's greatest challenge. Because the guys who are opposing me right now, they're the gatekeepers. And if you know what a gatekeeper is, we have them in church world, we have them in business. They don't always have a title. It's not the senior pastor necessarily. It's the ones who had the actual influence in the church. You know? and, and, but gatekeepers, it's not a negative term. It's just, it's just is what it is. It's the people who say, I'm going to allow this to happen and not allow this to happen. But how do they become gatekeepers? Because they've earned the right over years of faithful service. They've been trustworthy. They've always turned up. They've put the hard yards in and the people trust them. So they've earned the right to become a gatekeeper. But when those gatekeepers come against the leader who's made a dumb decision, um, it's in the leader's uh, intelligence to really want to say, I think I need to pause for a moment now and consider because if I go against this, my tenure as leader is probably just about up. And so we see this uh, year in, year out in church world and so on, where uh, the pastor thought he was in charge. You know. 
So what do you do? Because leading an organisation or being in your workplace and being a person of influence, most of the time is more about politics than it is about leadership. It's more about uh, protecting the position. It's more about staying in power than it is about doing something that morally needs to be done. How often in politics do you see someone make the right decision because it, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do and it's going to cost them their job? It's, it's fairly rare in the political sort of world. But great leaders are prepared to rise and fall on their core. Say, no, this is right or this is wrong and I don't care if I lose my job over this or whatever, but this is, this is the way it's going to be as long as I'm here. And so David made that call. And yet the thing that made it impacting for the whole nation, I think, was that he made that call and there was nothing in it for him. He wasn't making a thing saying, this is my grid for life and I just insist that everyone lives by that. Like a Christian raising a placard and saying, do this, don't do that because the Ten Commandments say so. He's not doing that. There's nothing in it for him. He wasn't raising a, an extra tax to say, this is going to be good for my bank account. And everyone goes, no wonder you'd make that decision. He's going, no, this, I'm doing this be, because it matters and people matter. And there's nothing in it for me about this, but I'm prepared to die over this one. And he would have had to have been to make that stand. Make no mistake. They were, the, they were the big dogs that were against him now, the mighty men, if you read the, read the passages. And so, he, so they, they caved. They caved. And uh, there's just something happens when a Christian person takes a breath of courage and it's so obvious that what they're standing for is not for themselves, but for those who can't stick up for themselves. For a wrong that won't be righted unless someone sticks themselves in harm's way and says... Let's talk about this, because I'm not backing down. And let the steamroller roll me if it will, but this is what I stand for. And this is what he did. And so uh, they caved, and, uh, and as, a, as a result, the whole nation was changed. You have that power in whatever your situation. And not all of us are in the crisis that David was in, but you've got to respect the man. At the, at the end of his tether, this is what he comes out with. The dogs of doom were barking loudest at the door of his destiny. He didn't realise Saul had just died. He was about to be made king, and he's just shown what raw leadership looks like. Courage, morality, people matter. Now he's fit to rule. It's taken him 14 years, but he's made the stand he always had to make to prepare himself to do this job, to lead the people. And God's been preparing you to lead where you are. You don't need a title. You don't need to be manager of this or CEO of that. Whoever you are, you're, you've been put in a situation too. And we can look at our situations and we can take an, a, a poverty posture which says, I'm more like a thermometer. I'm really good at reading the room. I know what the temperature is and I adapt to myself so I don't raise too many shackles around the place. But we're not called to be thermometers. Jesus said, your salt, your light, your presence, just by being there makes a difference. When you enter the room, you are the moral and spiritual thermostat, you. He's given you that authority. God's spirit is in each of us. We breathe him in. We're living from that power and that authority. It's not just having, like a, a, you might have a gun, but there's no authority on there. You've got the badge on your shoulder that says, I can use that gun. That's what we're like. We have the power given by Christ and the authority to be his ambassadors in whatever place we are. We are the thermostat. We set the temperature. And when we do it with all grace, we don't need to be just aggravating and argumentative and just be a painful person because people, I mean, they'll pick that up. But we can come with all grace, quietness, confidence and strength and we can stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. It might be at school, at work, wherever it would be. We say, no, I'm standing for what is right, whatever it costs. So whatever your situation, God's called you to be a thermostat. To, I wonder if you know what your tribe is. I'm not talking about your sports club or, or some, I'm talking about the people who align with your values. They're your guys. Come hell or high water, I'm with them. I've got the jersey on. I'm on the field. Perhaps you're looking for a... You long to have a tribe. You, you've, you've come here today looking, is, is this church any good? Can I, are these people any good? We're just like anyone else. We're just like anyone else. We try to do the things well. We do the best we can. But at the end of the day, we're as broken and busted up as anybody else. But we can, you can find a tribe here. You can commit yourself to a group of people and they commit themselves to you. Do you know what your tribe is? I'm not sure that we really live. Well, I think we're made for a tribe. Imperfect tribe. Let's pray as the band comes up. Let the Lord breathe into that. Lord, we just want to come before you. There's sort of no escape, Lord, from the light you shine on us. We're, 
we're all dealing in our communities with non-Christian and Christians alike. <coughs> Surrounded by people who have different value sets and different reasons for that. But Lord, we can't escape. We are who you've made us to be. We are those who've given their hearts to Christ and we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. And anything short of a life driven by that is a life that's going to be fairly fruitless in the kingdom. So Lord, I pray for a spirit of courage. There are people here who've been spoken to this morning who know there's a decision they need to make. There's a, there's a stand they need to make. There's a conversation they need to have. Someone has to make it. There's a, there's a choice of courage that's going to require you, I think, to ask for forgiveness. And that's going to take a lot of courage. But in that, in that one act of humility, we'll unlock transformation because judgment is gone then. Father, I just pray you give us courage to be who you've called us to be as we picture our Monday morning, that you give us courage to go into that place, not under the circumstance, but as a thermostat, setting the heat of that room in the cubicles next to us or the person at the other end of the Zoom call. We don't come in the same spirit of the world that is combative. We come with love and with grace and peace and joy and we can confound the spirit of this world through pure courage and your spirit. Lord, give us the words to say as we need them. Give us the faces that we need to have conversations with. Lord, I pray you to put a spirit of leadership in this place, that they would be change makers for their circumstance and culture.